Game of Thrones is a fantasy show, first airing in April of 2011 on HBO and ran until May 2019, concluding with season 8. The show is created by the directing duo of David Benioff and D.B. Weiss, nicknamed Diggin' D by fans. The show is adapted from the A Song of Ice and Fire novel series, created by author George R.R. R. Martin in 1996. The show is well known and respected for its world building, with the series taking place within the fictional continent of Westeros and the kingdoms and families within this continent, such as the joint royal family of houses Baratheon and Lannister in the city of King's Landing, or the Starks of Winterfell, or the Greyjoys of the Iron Islands, or on the complete other side of the world in the continent of Essos, you have the Targaryen siblings accompanied by the Dothraki. In fact, it is with the Dothraki that the series perfectly demonstrates two aspects of the show beloved by fans, those things being the world building and attention to detail. Being on the other side of the world to where a majority of the rest of the story takes place both diversifies and expands on the already expansive world. The detail in Game of Thrones is nothing short of extraordinary and is shown in some small and larger capacities with the Dothraki. From Dothraki traditions like the cutting of their braids on a Dothraki to signify a loss and the expansion of said braids to show their winnings. That might seem like a small and minute detail, but in reality it cleverly allows the audience to know the personalities of the characters before interaction is even made, allowing for the audience to identify the tougher and meaner personalities like Karl Drogo from the softer, more caring members of the Dothraki like Rakaro. The show also created a completely new language for members of the Dothraki to speak, just showing how much detail went into the crafting of the world of Game of Thrones. But what use is such a highly detailed world if it doesn't feel real or interesting? Luckily for Game of Thrones, it is well renowned for being very realistic. In fact, it can be too realistic for some. And... It's just very intense for the two of us to watch. Certainly, there's a lot of, like, when you're in episode two and we're killing a dog, a lot of babies dying in the mix, and um, pregnant women losing babies. The show has many different features that lend to it feeling like a real medieval world, for better or for worse. But to do this, they have to touch on a lot of sensitive and weird things that, as mentioned before, can turn people away. But for some, that can draw them in, no matter how disgusting the topic. From the incestuous relationship between siblings Jamie and Cersei, the aforementioned child murder, attempted child murder, rape, and the show's notorious bloody and violent deaths. Violent gory deaths could be written off as very gimmicky, as if they were just killing characters just for a fun death scene. However, in Game of Thrones, no matter how gory the death is, it always advances the plot in some way. The deaths in the show perhaps highlight the quality of the show most well known and respected for, and that is its unpredictability. Ned Stark was everything you expected of a hero in a fantasy story. He was honourable, good to a fault, brave, honest, and a man of his word. But after a tragic death in the royal court leaves the king of Westeros and Ned's best friend Robert Baratheon without his hand of the king, he calls upon Ned, his best friend, to fulfil the duty, and he does. And so Ned leaves for King's Landing to help his friend in need. During his time as hand of the king, Ned serves the realm with honour and serves justice where need be. So when a sword met Ned's neck at the end of season one and took his head from his body, fans are reasonably shocked by this. Sir Illyn, bring me his head. Look at me! 
This set a precedent for the show going forward, that this series didn't follow your typical fairy tale like story of the good, honourable heroes conquering evil. It immediately put all characters on the show in danger through stripping them of their plot armour main characters typically have in any medium of storytelling. And whilst it was uncommon for main characters to die in a story, it was even more uncommon for them to die so abruptly and quickly in their own story. Despite all the grieving the Stark family would have to go through, after the passing of Ned it did not seem that all hope was lost. His son Rob had been put on a path of vengeance alongside his mother to avenge his late father and seek justice. Rob. Despite what Ned's death taught us about not expecting a perfect ending, we as the audience had hope in Rob. Could it be possible that the death of Ned Stark was like what the Waynes was to Batman, or the death of Uncle Ben to Rob Spider-Man? It seemed possible. But unfortunately, like most good things, Rob Stark also had to come to an end. The Lannisters send their regards. What's one scene in the show that emotionally impacted you the most? The Red Wedding. Betrayed by the people he trusted, forced to watch those he loved slaughtered in front of his very eyes at the infamous Red Wedding. After agreeing to marry one of the daughters of Lord Walder Frey, Rob backs out of his pledge and instead marries a local nurse in his camp named Talisa. After this portrayal, the joint efforts of Lord Frey, Bruce Bolton and Tywin Lannister murder Rob, Talisa, Rob's brother Catelyn and Rob's unborn child. Through these deaths of genuinely good people, we learn one key rule of this world, that bad almost always prevails, and as Cersei Lannister says, When you play the Game of Thrones you win, or you die. There is no middle ground. And good characters, often seeking vengeance or justice, die. I'll kill them all. <laughs> Every one of them. I'll kill them all. They have your sisters. We have to get the girls back. And then we will kill them all.
When important characters in this show die, the likes of Ned and Rob, it isn't just for shock value, despite that being an added bonus. It demonstrates character flaws. Ned was just too good-willed and honest, and in the world of Game of Thrones, failure to play the game and being lying and deceitful can determine if you die or not. And Ned warning Cersei that he knows of her incestuous relationship and will tell the king of course loses him his head and the life of the king. Similarly, Rob being a good person and marrying for love is an honourable thing, but when it sacrifices his military advantage, he and those he loves pay the price for his actions. So when the honourable revenge-seeking warrior Oberyn Martell comes to King's Landing seeking revenge over the mountain for the murder of his sister and her children, you root for him to succeed. He has honourable intentions with justice that needs to be served. But at this point in the show, it's season 4, and Game of Thrones has gained itself a reputation as the show that subverts expectations and does the opposite of what you would both want and expect to happen. So when he goes into the trial by combat as the champion of Tyrion Lannister, who at the time was being accused of the murder of King Joffrey, you expect it to go horribly wrong for him, which, spoiler alert, it does. I've killed her children! Then I'm right then I smash their head in like this! But it is less about how he died and more about how we got there, as everyone was expecting him to go out like this, but the show was still able to surprise us with his death. Like stated before, going into this fight, we all expect Oberyn, the good guy, to inevitably lose the fight due to the expectation we have for Game of Thrones at this point, to subvert our expectations into what typically wouldn't happen. However, as the fight commences, Oberyn dominates it. He is quick, strong, and confident. But we still have the notion that he will fail eventually. But that's when you realise that this is Game of Thrones, the show that does the unexpected, and yet we're all expecting Oberyn to fail. So it becomes apparent to us that to surprise us, they're going to do the typical hero beat the villain, thereby doing the expected unexpectedly and subverting our expectations by not subverting them at all. That realisation puts many other things in this season into perspective, like how the show had taught that evil always prevails, and yet the show's most punchable face and person fans wanted to see dead the most for the longest time is now actually dead, once again subverting our expectations by doing the normal thing that would happen in a story. So when Oban jams his spear into the chest of the mountain, taking him to the ground, we breathe a sigh of relief. But of course, Oban did not come out of that fight alive. He may have won it, but he didn't survive it. And this was because of Oban's character flaw of arrogance. He had won the fight. He had impaled the mountain, thereby avenging his family. However, that was not enough for Oban, and so he arrogantly let his guard down drawing his spear from the mountain's chest and directing his attention towards Tywin Lannister, demanding a confession for his involvement in his sister's murder. And this seals Oberyn's fate and gets him killed. Sad as that may be, the show still impressively was able to do the very thing fans went into the fight expecting to happen and was still surprised by the outcome. Now, whilst characters dying leads to some great storylines and shocking moments, it's when the characters are alive, of course, that they are the most enjoyable. More specifically, the character interactions are a huge highlight, especially for a show like Game of Thrones with over 30 main characters. They allow for fun comedic moments, emotional moments, and allow us to see several different sides to different characters, leading for them to be more than just one-dimensional characters. A good example of this is the interactions between Arya Stark and Tywin Lannister. We first meet Tywin in the seventh episode of season one, and it is a rather cold scene where he lectures at and shouts at his son Jaime. He is shown to be a calculated man who only cares about his family's legacy, and nothing more with little signs of emotion and affection towards others. But when we meet him again in season 2, we see a new side to him that we had not seen before. A side that we wouldn't see much in the seasons to come, but he appoints Arya as his cupbearer, not knowing of her true identity and family. And he treats her kindly, and voices his respect for her, respect he doesn't even show his own children. You're my daughter! You will do as I command, and you will marry Loras Tyrell. At this point in the story, Tywin is planning a war against one of the show's heroes, Rob, and yet even Arya seems to like him in a sense, so we gain a liking to him too. So in seasons to come, when Tywin says and does some more despicable things, we're more 
open to hearing out his reasonings for actions we resent him for, like when he tells his son Tyrion why he hates him so much. Of course, we still side with Tyrion in this scene, but we are more understanding to Tywin due to the compassionate and nice side he is seen to have. When have you ever done something that wasn't in your interest, but solely for the benefit of the family? The day that you were born. I wanted to carry you into the sea and let the waves wash you away. Instead, I let you live. And I brought you up as my son. Because you're a Lannister. However, Tywin's relationship with his son Tyrion also allows us to sympathise as we are able to understand how isolated and alone he feels in the world, especially from those who are meant to be his family, like Tywin. What the hell do you know about being a bastard? All dwarves are bastards in their father's eyes. Tyrion's outburst at his father and sister in the season 4 episode, The Laws of Gods and Men, is regarded amongst fans as one of, if not the best scene in the entire show, even winning actor Peter Dinklage an Emmy for his performance in this scene. Yes, father, I'm guilty. Guilty? Is that what you want to hear? You admit you poisoned the king? No. Of that I'm innocent. I'm guilty of a far more monstrous crime. I'm guilty of being a dwarf. You are not on trial for being a dwarf. Oh, yes I am. I've been on trial for that my entire life. Have you nothing to say in your defense? Nothing but this. I did not do it. I did not kill Joffrey, but I wish that I had. Watching your vicious bastard die gave me more relief than a thousand lying whores. This scene was so iconic and beloved by fans, as it was the first time we really got to see Tyrion just speak his mind towards his family, clearly showing how the interactions between the characters were so strong that this moment of Tyrion simply speaking his mind to them was one of the most beloved. Whilst characters like Tywin and Arya help humanise people who they share the screen with, with some characters, their interactions with others only serve to further alienate you from them and hate them. Most notoriously, Joffrey Baratheon. Game of Thrones has a large number of morally grey characters, in which you cannot call all good, but you could also not call all bad, like Tywin, the Hound, or Theon Greyjoy. But Joffrey was a rare exception in that case, as he was just purely evil. He is considered to be one of the most hated and loathed characters in TV history, with his death in the second episode of season 4 being celebrated around the world. By default, any person who shared a scene with Joffrey came out great by comparison, no matter how evil they were, with the scenes of Joffrey getting hurt or disrespected being the highlight of the episode for many. Any man who must say I am the king is no true king. I'll make sure you understand that when I've won your war for you. The king is tired. See him to his chambers. Come along. Tired. tired. We have so much to celebrate. A wedding to plan. You must rest. Grand Maester, perhaps some essence of nightshade to help him sleep. I'm not tired. I'm telling mother. And you can't. Honey. Not You're this. talking to a king! And now I've struck a king. No. No. Another character who faced similar scrutiny from the audience, although not nearly on the same level as Joffrey, was Jaime Lannister. Similar to Joffrey, he was simply an awful person. From his incestuous relationship with his sister, to his constant opposition to the heroes of the show, and his blatant disrespect to others, he was just another unredeemable villain of the show. Or at least, that's how he seemed before the show paired him with Brienne of Tarth. This turns Jamie from one of the show's most hated villains 
to a morally grey character with one of the show's most best and compelling character arcs. We start Jamie's journey with Brienne with him constantly ridiculing her for her appearance, but as his time with her continues, we see him change into a compassionate person who puts his life on the line for others selflessly, like in the pivotal moment when Jamie defends Brienne, leading to him losing his hand. <laughs> Yeah, this should help you, remember? <laughs> this forces Jamie to shed his ego completely, as the thing he prided himself on the most was his fighting skill, and in an instant that was stripped away from him, all for someone else. From this point on, we see a more honest and honourable version of Jamie that you could respect, far detached from the monster of the earlier seasons. He told me to. Bring him my father's head. Then he turned to his pyromancer. Burn them all, he said. Burn them in their homes, burn them in their beds. Tell me if your precious Randy commanded you to kill your own father and stand by while thousands of men women and children burned alive, would you have done it? Would you have kept your oath then? First I killed the pyromancer and then when the king turned to flee I drove my sword into his back. Burn them all, he kept saying. Burn them all. I don't think he expected to die. He he meant to band with the rest of us and rise again, reborn as a dragon, turn his enemies to ash. He slit his throat to make sure that didn't happen. It isn't very often that a show is considered perfect. Only few shows like Breaking Bad, The Sopranos, or The Wire are considered to be perfect and are hailed as the best shows of all time, and Game of Thrones was amongst those shows, being praised as perfect television and one of the best shows ever, but unfortunately, the key word in that sentence is the word was. Since the final airing of Game of Thrones' final episode on May 19th, 2019, there's been a severe lack of interest in the show since. As you can see on this Google Trends graph, it shows that searches for Game of Thrones has dropped significantly since the show ended. Breaking Bad ended back in 2013 and still to this day is talked about and praised widely despite the show concluding 8 years ago. It is commonly agreed upon amongst the show's audience that everything we have just praised the show for, from the show's great characters and storylines to its unpredictability and great writing, all seem to have fallen apart most prominently in the infamous Season 8. Before we are able to look at why, we must first look at the how. The show's later seasons, in particular Season 8, left a lot of its characters feeling unlike themselves, devoid of a lot of the characteristics that made them themselves or the focus that they had in previous seasons. A good example of this is Jon Snow. Jon Snow was perhaps the closest the show came to one singular main character. He was a clear-cut hero, with his storylines being less about political scheming, as many others were, but simply about life or death, in which he was the hero fighting for life. Out of all of the Stark children, he was the most like his father Ned. Both would rather die than sacrifice their honour, and stuck by their word and good nature to almost a suicidal capacity and both of their good natures resulted in them losing their lives for doing the right thing. Unlike Ned, John was rewarded the opportunity of being resurrected but unfortunately his second chance at life felt rather wasted. Once John was back, he was given very little to do. Aside from the epic Battle of the Bastards in Season 6, most of the significant things John did from then on were able to be accomplished by someone else. But John feels at his most useless in Season 8. Despite finding out that he is the heir to the Iron Throne, Nothing interesting is explored with that revelation, and just reduces his character down to repeating the same two sentences, I don't want it, and you are my queen. She is my queen. You are my queen. Daenerys is our queen. She is our queen. She'll be a good queen. 
You are my queen. I don't know what else I can say. You can say nothing. I don't want it. I told you I don't want it. I never wanted a crown. Another unfortunate victim of the later seasons forgetting the significance of its characters is Tyrion Lannister. Tyrion was most people's favourite character. He was beloved for his brilliant mind, of his great intelligence and decision making. But as the show progressed, he began to make more and more stupid decisions and plans, with his most infamous being his plan in the season 8 battle, The Long Night, where he makes the call to hide the women, children and other vulnerable people during a battle in the crypts of Winterfell, where the bodies of dead Starks lie. This doesn't seem like too bad of an idea until you realise the person they are facing, the Night King, is able to raise the dead and use as a part of his army. We're in a crypt. Nobody thought of that. He's bringing all the dead people back to life and they put the women and children in a crypt with all the dead people. So, brah. Tyrion is smart, but I guess not that smart. But perhaps the two biggest victims of the blatant character assassination in Season 8 are Jaime and Daenerys Targaryen, both of whom suffered extremely similar fates. Both Jaime and Danny suffer from rushed conclusions to their respective storylines that because they were not given enough attention and care led to the decisions made by the two not feeling like themselves. First of all we have Jaime, who as we talked about previously went on a change throughout the entire show from a hateable villain to one of the show's leading heroes. This was of course due to the character development made to his character as a result of his prolonged journey with Brienne and his detachment from his sister Cersei. However, in season 8, Jaime makes the decision out of nowhere to leave Brienne, breaking her heart in an attempt to go back to his sister where he eventually dies in her arms. This goes against everything the show had been setting up. Before this, we had seen scenes of Jaime questioning and criticising his sister, something he didn't do when he was his villainous self. Tell me if your precious Randy commanded you to kill your own father and stand by while thousands of men, women and children burned alive, would you have done it? Would you have kept your oath then? She's going to die. Unless you can convince her to change her course of action. Difficult to do from here. When have I ever been able to convince Cersei of anything? Try. If not for yourself, if not for her, then for every one of the million people in that city, innocent or otherwise. To be honest, I never really cared much for them. Innocent or otherwise. Similarly, the show had presented Danny as the hero of the people. Her ambition throughout the series was to take back the Iron Throne, not for power, but to liberate the people from the often tyrannical rule of its monarchs. She had shown signs of being cruel and merciless before, but only to bad people who she felt deserved it, people who harmed other innocent people. But in Season 8, undeservingly, her mercilessness was taken to a new level when she used her dragon to decimate King's Landing and all of the innocent people within it women and children alike. Like previously mentioned, Daenerys was never this harsh and cruel, especially not to innocent people who she was solely motivated to liberate and save. The show did next to nothing to set this twist up and resulted in a resolution that felt unearned. The endings of these characters was not necessarily the bad part in these situations, rather the execution. If Jamie and Danny had ended in exactly the same way they did, it would be fine so long as the show properly developed their characters into that position and set it right up, which the show unfortunately did not. The writing in the final season of the show also shared this problem, with some scenes and writing simply coming off as dumb, like the scene in Season 8, Episode 4, when one of Danny's dragons die. While Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and Euron's forces. That's right, you heard him correctly. She just forgot. Despite this being a planned out mission with her expecting the Iron Fleet to be there, she just forgot about them for the convenience of the story so that she would be weakened leaving her only with one dragon. This final season was full of moments that just didn't pay off as well as they should have. The unpredictability was now simply used for shock value with no true narrative reason for some things happening, and the vulnerability we felt for characters before is gone. 
with main characters now being shielded in plot armor. One great example of the show not paying off things to a satisfying way and covering the characters in plot armor is in the season 8 episode, The Long Night. This episode is the long-awaited showdown with the villain The Night King, leader of the White Walkers. The Night King is to Game of Thrones what Thanos was to the MCU, a villain set up through years of teasing that ultimately culminates in one huge battle with the character. But unlike Avengers Infinity War and Endgame, the show just did not pay off the build-up to the Night King well. First of all, on the production side of things, the episode was made unbearably dark for no apparent reason. This led to the battle being barely visible. The battle was ended when Arya sneaks up on and stabs the Night King, killing him. This was evidently done for the sole purpose of shock value. Arya had no relation or reason to kill the Night King. So from a narrative standpoint, this result did not make sense and did not feel deserved, earned, or good. Despite it being the predictable outcome, the series had linked Jon and the Night King throughout the entire series, but unfortunately he is put on the side and not awarded a duel with the Night King, once again bringing into question why Jon was brought back to life in the first place. All of these examples of lazy and bad writing or poor character work clearly shows us one huge problem with this final season, allowing us to finally explore why Game of Thrones has changed in the way that it has. These examples clearly show a large lack of interest from behind the scenes of the show, and this claim becomes more apparent when you consider what was going on in the life of the directors at the time. At the time, David Benioff and D.B. Weiss were offered their very own Star Wars trilogy, which clearly it being Star Wars, they would have been keen to accept and start working on. This could help explain why so many things were rushed or lacked consistency because of their new commitments. This lack of focus and care is shown in many other ways. For instance, we started this documentary by talking about the small attention to detail the show had. Well, like many other good things the show had, that was also lost. We can see this the most in Season 8, when a Starbucks coffee cup was left in the shot unnoticed until fans pointed it out upon airing of the episode. As shown throughout this documentary, Game of Thrones is a show that handles every small detail with care and grace, so it would be unlike the show to dip in quality this significantly without any good reason. It also must not have helped that they had completely run out of books to adapt by the time they were done with the show. George R. R. Martin, for lack of a better word, is lazy, or at least he doesn't have the same passion for his series as he once did, as his last instalment in the A Song of Ice and Fire series, A Dance of Dragons, came out in 2011, 10 years ago. Evidently, D&D began Game of Thrones, expecting Martin's series to have been finished before they even got to the end of the show. Martin has revealed that there are only two more books to come in the series, but they have yet to be released. It was back in season 6 when the show had overtaken the books, and that was when the critics started to have their first complaints over the show. Minor at the time, but complaints nonetheless. This suggests that D&D were not as talented with creating new storylines for the show as they were with adapting the novels, although they were seemingly given information from Martin on how the show was to progress and conclude, it still must not be easy to adapt novels that simply do not exist. To conclude, Game of Thrones was a show that challenged what we expect to see from television and entertainment in general. It was a show packed to the brim with shocking moments, great scenes, and subverted all our expectations. Unfortunately, its legacy may be overshadowed by its rough ending, caused by a lack of material and focus as the seasons went on, but should be remembered for the brilliance it demonstrated and the new meaning it brought to the fantasy genre and television as a whole. The future of Game of Thrones is luckily far from over, with several prequel series in development with one named House of the Dragon, focused on the Targaryen dynasty of the past, set to release as early as 2022. And luckily, the careers of the people behind the show have not all been ruined by the tainted view of the show as a whole as a result of the last season. While show director's D&D has been dropped from their Star Wars trilogy due to backlash over season 8, a lot of the actors have been able to find work in some big projects most notably, Rob Stark and Jon Snow's actors, Richard Madden and Kit Harington, have both landed themselves major roles in Marvel Studios' upcoming film, The Eternals. The show undoubtedly has a damaged reputation, but in time, whether it be through George R.R. Martin's upcoming installments in the franchise or the upcoming spin-offs in the works, hopefully the series can regain the trust it has lost from its fanbase and rebuild its reputation.